What's up, peeps? Welcome to the 70K Q&A, answering your toughest questions, this time specifically about the fitness industry. Although I must admit, a few questions slipped in where I don't think people actually read the caption, but I'll answer those anyway. All right, question number 20, we're gonna build gradually as always. Who are the ones you would like to make a collab with? With, with, is that a, just make a collab? And who would you never accept a collab from? So uh, I've been on a bunch of different like podcast channels and stuff like that. Um, but I think I don't really like personally making that super long form content just because it's a hassle to edit and, you know, to record and everything. And especially with China and everything, it's it's kind of a pain in the in the in the butt and the ass to do. So I probably won't do a lot of like podcast style of content on the channel. If I do, I would probably make a second channel. Uh, as for who I, I would accept a collab from, basically any of the guys I talk to on a regular basis. It's only weird when it's someone I've never talked to and they're like, hey bro, could I come on your channel? And I'm like, no. And as for who I would never accept a collab with, a bunch of people actually wanted me to do a G Shred podcast thing. Uh, you know, talk things out. Not interested in that, okay? I think who you associate with is super important. And, you know, the Athlean X convention live thing is coming up as well. And there were a few names on the poster that I was like, hmm, yeah, you should know better than that. I mean, ugh, disappointing. All right, question number 19. Congratulations, bro. Question, what do you believe is missing right now in YouTube fitness content? I'm starting to upload videos myself, blah, 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 blah. Would like to get some ideas on what you think could improve the platform and help new lifters. I would say just being genuine. I see a lot of these bigger channels. Yeah, they have millions of subscribers. Everything is well polished, produced, etc. But there's not really a community aspect there. And so I've seen some, some fairly small channels. They don't have a big sub count, but the subs they do have uh, there really is that sense of community, like um, Basement Bodybuilding. I've been watching a lot of his stuff, great content. And, you know, if you look at his comment count, it's almost as high as some channels that have a million plus subscribers, which really tells you something about the level in of engagement that this kind of genuine content can bring. So don't focus too much on clickbait or on production value or on the latest fads. Just focus on the people, not just the numbers, but the actual people on interacting with people, engaging with people. I think uh, Alpha Destiny has done a great job with this as well. A lot of bigger channels just give up with even interacting with the people who support them. And I think that's sad to see. And so if you're a new channel starting out, don't ignore the people who are you are supposed to be helping, you know? Next question, when training for hypertrophy and volume slash growth optimization, if I'm not mistaken, 10 to 20 working sets per week is ideal. I mean, it's a good starting point, but it's gonna be individual. Anyway, is this 10 to 20 hard or close to failure sets or does this include moderate sets? Does it need to be direct muscle training sets or would bench press be counted for something like triceps? So this is part of the reason why I prefer to add things up by movement pattern rather than muscle group, because then you go into like, oh, bench press is a set for triceps, or is it half a set, or is it a third of a set? Like, where is my grip width? What are my leverages? It just gets maddening and not really worth doing. And I think most people are overthinking this if they really go down that road. As for proximity to failure, I typically say, you know, five reps or more in reserve, it's not really worth counting for anything. But it does, it does vary a little bit. You know, something like Shaco might have you doing triples with 75% in the deadlift. You know, you might be 10 reps in reserve or something for some people. Is it still a working set, even though there's many reps in reserve? Probably because it's a freaking deadlift and because of the intention, the focus, and it is still effective training. And so, you know, something like a, a cable lateral raise, yeah, you're probably gonna have to go closer to failure uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of factors here. I'll definitely do a whole video on why the effective reps model is a little bit incomplete. It's good. It's a great starting point, but it's not everything. 
Next question, in your book, do you teach people how to program and how to train themselves from day one? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where something like starting strength, it's, it's set in stone and it's very concrete, which is good. But at a certain point, you're going to have to learn how to manipulate other variables, which is what my book will teach you to do. And I think it's best to view training as an experiment, but you have to learn how to listen to your body, when and where to tweak which variables. And it is a process and it's something that's going to take many years to learn. But a lot of people never even learn that process and they never even learn what signs to look for or even like basic definitional stuff. And so, yeah, my book is definitely going to be helpful for that. I do have templates and I have gotten good feedback on them, but I even hesitated to have those. And I really do urge you to create your own plan because doing someone else's experiment is not going to be optimal for you. It really does. You have to be mentally involved in the process, which is going to be a lot more work, but it's also going to be a lot more reward as well. So feedback on my book has been overwhelmingly positive, but there have been a couple comments where someone is like, just tell me what to do. Oh, like, why do I have to learn this kind of stuff? Well, do you give a fuck about your results? Because if you do, you're going to have to learn. Next question. What's your view on the light dumbbell system of the bronze era bodybuilders? Apparently Sandow and the other strongmen used three to seven pound dumbbells, which is like one and a half to three kilos or so, not very heavy at all, to get swole using one set of 50 to 100 reps, focusing on extreme mind-muscle connection to build a gnarly pump twice a day, six days a week. All right, so I will say that it probably won't hurt, but I will also say that it probably won't help, especially if you're not doing other real training. Now, it might help recovery, it might help, you know, get, get blood in the biceps, etc., which can be good, but again, if you're using this to replace other training, you're not going to get very far. Plus, I think that uh, fitness marketing, it's not a new thing, okay? It's been around forever, and this is more than likely just something to sell you a product. Next question, is it possible in the current era for a personal trainer and content creator to make a living without spending ungodly amounts of time on his or her phone? Thanks. Um... Not really. I mean, I probably spend 10, 11, 12 hours looking at a screen and it sucks. Sometimes my eyes hurt. I use this shit to uh, make my eyes not red <laughs> when I'm filming. But the reality is it's tough. It's tough. And, you know, it is a lot of work. And especially if you're editing your own stuff, which I plan on continuing to do, it is a lot of looking at a screen. And I think some people don't actually understand what the job entails. They think, oh, you just go to the gym and you lift weights. And then there's more to it than that. That being said, eventually maybe you can outsource the editing and get to the point where it's not that much screen time. Maybe you have some ongoing businesses or running ads or something. Senator, we run ads. I see. Which is more passive income. But even so, it's almost certainly going to take several years to get to that point. Next question, who have to train harder, naturals or guys on gear, and why? If I'm natural and don't have the advantages, do I have to train harder to create the adaptation? Do I have to do sets to failure, or is progressive overload and leaving reps in the tank just fine? All right, a lot to unpack there. I did do a whole video on natural versus enhanced, which I will link up somewhere up there. I think a good way of viewing it is that going on gear allows you a lot more flexibility in your training. There's one guy at my gym who I'm pretty sure is on gear because he has no idea what the fuck he's doing, and yet he's getting sizable, especially in the not leg department. I'll see him doing like 10 kilo rows and ton, 10 kilo dumbbell presses, and yet he's getting bigger and more vascular at the same time. That's when it's like, yeah, I don't know. You don't know what you're doing, clearly, and yet you are getting strangely great results that's when you just can't do that as a natural and if you follow enhanced lifters and you copy them which i did for many years it's just not going to work point blank it's just not going to work and you can either train a super high volume or super low volume and you know if you're on a gram or two of gear you're just going to grow especially if you have really good growth response to uh anabolic steroids so i think as a natural you have to be a lot more precise with your training. And as for if you have to train to failure, you don't necessarily have to train to failure, 
but it's going to be pretty exercise dependent and there's a lot of nuance here. I've done multiple videos about this. My book goes into it. The next book will go into it even more. And so you don't necessarily need to go to failure, but it is quite situational. All right, next question from FitLab. What's up, dude? How do you make your videos so quickly with all the extra editing you've been adding in the past several months? Asking of a friend who needs help making the videos, the videos much faster. Uh, I would say I don't focus on perfectionism. I focus on making them good enough. And you can go both ways. There's going to be sort of this continuum between quality and quantity, especially if you're working alone. You know, if you're, if you're making your own videos, I mean, if you come out with a video a day, the quality is not going to be the highest, right? But it might not matter that much. If you nail the title and thumbnail, right? Like, sadly, based on YouTube, that is a huge part of the puzzle. Whereas if you focus on one super high quality video every few months, if they take off, you might do really, really well and you'll convert better, but uh, growth will likely be a little bit slower. So I focus on making the videos good enough and choosing topics that I'm interested in so that I actually have an interest and get the job done. I filmed videos before that I didn't like, I wasn't really interested in, and they just sat in my phone and, and weren't really edited very quickly or easily because I, uh, I didn't really give a shit about the topic. So I'm quite selective about the topics that I choose. I don't just, you know, oh yeah, make a video. Blah, blah. Like you have to really focus on videos and, and projects that you are passionate about. Uh, and then after that, you know, spending three times as long to make a video 10% better probably isn't worth it. Once it's to that minimum threshold, which you might have to lower, uh, I think it's good enough, and then you can focus on upping the quantity side of things. All right, next question, how can I learn how to effectively plan my own training programs? How do I create workouts that help me reach my goal, which is building building maximum muscle like you? I don't look for a cutting edge program. I don't want a ready to wear program. I don't want the fish, I want to learn how to fish. Should I get a certification? Da -da -da -da. Is your book everything I need to know as a natural 36 years old, training age one year? Thank you very much. Um, so it sounds like your head is in the right spot. Um, I think cookie cutter programs, they're okay at the start as long as the program is not terrible. But yeah, eventually you want to work towards creating your own training program and your own system. And yeah, my book will definitely help with that. Uh, it goes through everything. It doesn't feed you, oh, this is what you have to do. It's more uh, of a suggestion. Okay, you can try this, you can try this, you can try this. Again, you still have to be mentally involved in the process. I don't think you need a certification. I'm getting a certification now, but I might not even sit the exam just because I don't particularly need one. And I think most certifications are kind of trash. If I speak to other personal trainers, often they're like, yeah, I got certified, but I didn't really learn anything useful. So I would say most information you can find in books or even just online for free. Next question, how important is RPE and RIR? Is it necessary? I hate this shit. As a natural, can I not simply just train with maximum effort like enhanced guys or like you all out? A lot of enhanced guys don't train that hard. Seriously, a few do, so, you know, some definitely do, but a lot of them just sandbag the shit out of every set. The bar barely slows, and yet they grow because they are enhanced. So a lot of enhanced guys, they're faking their effort, and I can tell, because the bar speed is barely slowing, and they're like, ah, rah, like, it's just, it's smoke and mirrors, man. When you look at some of these guys, maybe I'll do a whole video on that, but a lot of guys, they're not actually training that hard. Again, it's just a show. That being said, you don't have to count reps in reserve or RPE. I don't write down that in my training log. Uh, I just assume that I'm probably keeping a rep or two in the tank on squats. Usually, sometimes. I'm better about this than I used to be. Um, same thing for hinges. I think, unless it's like a back extension, going to failure is probably not a great idea. Uh, and then something like a uh, bench press, I might keep one rep in the tank. I'm usually pretty good about judging so that I don't actually fail the rep. But you don't need to track RPE or RAR, but you do have to recognize that they matter. Next question, curious if you have any recommendations for ab exercises if you feel like your core is weak or lagging, especially on squats. 
I would say front squats are probably going to be the best core exercise for this. Maybe Zercher squats because the weight is out in front of you and you have to like brace and flex and squeeze to not breathing out, obviously. But you do have to make sure that everything is locked down and the weight in front increases that demand even more. If you get good at front squats, your core is going to be rock solid for a high bar squat and especially for a low bar squat because the, uh, the bass is closer to your hips anyway. Uh, I would say pal-off presses as well, where you take the uh, you take a cable pointing to the side and then you press out, in, out, in. Those are good as well. Hanging leg raises, yes, they do work your hip flexors as well. That's totally fine, not an issue. Planks are also good, as are the the ab wheel, side planks, side planks with leg raises, all that kind of stuff. Um, my book has a bunch of recommendations. It's something that I personally need to work on more, and. Um, if your core is a weak point, this could actually be limiting your squat. Next question, honestly, how are people falling, still falling, for this Turk scandal? Greg openly admits to it being bunk, people still buy it. Dunno anymore. Yeah, I don't know, I've given up. I think some people are just too fucking stupid. Uh, not all his followers, not all his subscribers. You know, he does get called out when he does something wrong and then, you know, later he apologizes but you can tell he's not really sorry. It's just like, ah, I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar for the fifth fucking time. And then he's he's very good at apologizing. He's very good at apologizing. I'll say that. Um, and it's very believable. He's very convincing and well-spoken, charismatic. But, you know, at the end of the day, he's still a piece of shit. If people want to follow a piece of shit, well, I can't do much more than I've already done. Next question. With all your knowledge now... Flattering. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. How would you start a training program for ma maximum muscle mass or hypertrophy as a skinny dude if you could start all over again? What plan or program, what philosophy, what mistakes would you avoid, and what would you do differently? Uh, wow, a lot to unpack there. I would say more consistency, not with just showing up to the gym, because that was never a problem. Not with effort, that was never a problem either but with the training structure, with the exercises, with the execution, probably a little bit less ego lifting, a less, a little bit less chasing the numbers uh, and more focus on just doing things right, not program hopping. Um, eating enough was never too much of a problem. It was a little bit in 2019 when I tried to stay pretty shredded for a long period of time. Um, but overall, I would say my program now maybe modified and scale down a little bit would be pretty good for uh, my year one or year two self. But uh, yeah, you're going to have to, again, experimentation. Uh, I'm probably going to say it like eight times in this video. It is a necessity. Next question about the stretch and the squeeze. Uh -huh. People talk about training muscles in both a stretched and squeezed position. I understand the utility of training in mid to stretch position as there seems to be growing evidence that it could be better but what about the squeeze is there benefits there that i'm not seeing perhaps it is it aids in mind muscle connection but i'm not sure thanks for the content yeah no problem so i would say if you had to choose one stretched is better especially on a per set basis so if you if you are short on time if you're stretched for time focus on stretching movements because they're gonna yeah they'll create more damage but probably also more hypertrophy per set but if you have more time, it might be worth focusing on contracting movements, especially because they possibly are triggering growth through different pathways and they are different movements, right? Like doing a spider curl might actually provide a different stimulus compared to an inclined dumbbell curl or a pelican curl or something like that. So I would say focusing on the squeeze if there is resistance in the squeeze position is rarely a bad thing and having a variety of movements is probably an overall positive when it comes to maximizing your hypertrophic potential. Squats are not going to be something that maximizes all heads of the quadriceps. Bench press is not gonna maximize all heads of the triceps, right? There are areas, and my next book will go into this, that you're not going to maximally develop with compound movements, you know? My long head game is absolutely on point because I do a lot of long head work 
which compound movements just don't really target very effectively. Ace in point, my triceps have started to chafe against my lats. Sad times. And by sad, I mean awesome. Next question, when and how should I train to failure, absolute failure, technical failure? On every exercise, all sets, one sets, last set, what are the prerequisites, beginner, intermediate, advanced? So there's a lot of variables there. I would say the best way to look at this is just to simplify this and think about it in terms of training stress. Do you have too much of it? Do you have not enough of it? Or do you have the right amount of it? And this is something where you will have to go by feel and see if you are recovering. Are you progressing? Are you experiencing signs of overreaching, sore joints, uh, sleep disrupted, waking up early, having trouble falling asleep, etc.? Uh, the next book will have a whole bunch. It's like a list of 20 things to try to decide if your training stress is too much. It's also going to vary not just with training level, but on other factors as well. How is your diet? Psychological stress is a big one, very, very underrated there. And so how often you should train to failure, how many sets, which exercises, etc. A lot of it has to do with the volume you're doing and then is your training stress either too much, just enough, or not enough. If it's not enough, you can go close to failure more times. Maybe to technical failure, maybe to absolute failure. You can do drop sets, partials, eccentrics, whatever. So it really just does depend. And so it's almost like a volume question. Oh, how many sets should I do, bro? Well, it depends on what you can recover from and what you need to progress. Next question. In your opinion, what are the biggest differences training natural versus enhanced regarding frequency, volume, sets, and reps? I would say both are going to be limited by structural integrity, aka injury, anyway. So yeah, mu maybe muscularly you can recover from more if you are enhanced, but typically, and this is probably part of the reason why they might use higher reps, blood flow restriction, uh, partial range of motion, just pumping the muscle full of blood because the muscle can recover, but because they're stronger typically, they are going to be limited even more by their joints. Um, and so yeah, that's definitely a consideration. And so when I see some channels promoting, oh, like 10 to 20 reps is moderate, 20 to 30 reps is high reps. I don't know, man, 19 or 20 reps, that's high reps, that's not moderate. Five to 10 reps is low reps. Nine reps, low reps, really? I don't, I don't think so. And again, being enhanced, natural hypertrophy had a video called Steroids Make You Stupid, which I responded to uh, a while ago. And in some ways it's kind of true because when anything works, you're not forced to really analyze the process. If you're on like a couple grams of gear and you're like, oh, you can't really A, B test your program because everything works. The A works, the B works, the C works. Going into the gym, I mean, you'll get a quad pump from walking your dog and shit like that. And this is probably part of the reason why they think, oh, the pump is great. Well, yeah, because you're on anabolics, which causes a big pump, which causes growth. No, it's because you're an anabolic, which causes growth. And the side effect is the pump. And so whenever I listen to an enhanced lifter, I really have to take it with a big, big grain of salt. What are the main factors to consider when you make a training program for yourself? I would say goals is a big one. Preferences, enjoyment, schedule, the time you have available. Volume tolerance, ability to recover, exercise selection preferences, you know, some exercises I like, but they're just, they just beat me up too much. And so I swap them out for something else. So, you know, enjoyment is important, but it's not the only thing. And then, you know, volume, intensity, frequency, periodization, progressions, etc. What are your thoughts on fitness related companies, Nike, Gatorade, Gymshark, using models that aren't physically fit? In fact, very far from. So this used to uh, this used to piss me off, I, and I think it's been politicized. But it, it used to actually piss me off. Like, oh, uh, how dare they? Oh, this is oh the fall of the Western world. Like, uh, you know, they didn't earn it. Like, this shouldn't be a thing. But uh, you know, I, I don't really give a shit anymore. You know, and I think if your day is ruined by seeing 
a somewhat fluffy model on the cover of a magazine, you're pretty thin-skinned. And so are they sending a great message? No, not necessarily. But people don't seem to get upset when they see some roided-out freak who is absolutely 100% unhealthy on the cover of a magazine. So why would they get upset at seeing, you know, a chick who's 33% body fat on the cover, right? I mean, that they might actually be healthier than the enhanced lifter on the cover. And so it's sort of hard to justify the outrage with one and not the other. Actually, uh, Revival Fitness did a video about this, how um, if you take steroids and then you call out, you know, the fluffy models for being unhealthy, it's kind of hypocritical. And I actually have a video planned, I don't know what the title will be, probably something like why I empathize but don't support the healthy at any size movement. And this is because I don't think it's a good thing for the world. I, I think it is sort of encouraging people to give up and loving your body is okay, but don't just you know give up and then sacrifice your health to do that. It's a little bit delusional, it's a little bit immature, but I get it. I understand where they're coming from and I think a lot of people in the fitness industry should be a little bit more understanding and empathize with people's situations because a lot of people have it very easy and they don't even understand how it's not easy for everyone. And I would hate to be coached by someone who didn't even try to empathize with my situation because for a lot of heavier people, it ain't easy. So I do think we should be more inclusive and less, uh, less dickish put it that way. Question number two, with all your years of experience considered, it's not that many years, what do you think of the fitness industry in its current state? Is it getting better, worse, maybe a bit of both? Yeah, I would say a bit of both. I think the good content is getting better. Uh, I think it's very competitive. I think there's a ton of quality information out there, mm, but there's also a lot of bad information, especially on some platforms. You know, I see Sarmads. I have People message me who are 17 years old and they're getting ads for SARMs on on Instagram, which is pretty fucked up, pretty fucked up. There's still a lot of misinformation out there. It seems like a lot of these platforms just don't give a fuck about what gets put out there. In fact, they'll openly promote it. I know uh, Ben Carpenter, he made a post on his Instagram saying that one of his videos got stolen and it made him look like he was promoting a product where you put like herbs and spices in your belly button to help lose fat. They just, they took his clip, they doctored it, they edited it, edited it, edited it, <laughs> edited it, <laughs> to make it seem like he was promoting this bullshit product. He reported it and nothing happened. They're like, nah, this is fine. Like they can take your image and just make it look like you're promoting this BS. Totally fine. At a certain point, there's nothing I can do. Right, like I can call out the BS, but there's always more of it, and it's very productive, and people are making shit tons of money doing scammy stuff, and it sucks to see. It's shitty, and the sad part is a lot of the people who are getting scammed will call you out when <laughs> will will be angry when you call out the people who are scamming them. That that's that's what really gets me. Right, question number one, by far the most upvoted one. Do you ever get any DMs or aggressive confrontations from the influencers you call out? No, and this is because I make sure that I am not only right, but clearly right. Because if you're just right and you know they can twist your words, it's a little bit debatable. I really, at this point, only go for slam dunks. You know, where someone is wrong, it's misinformation, and usually only when it's clear to me, and it should be clear to everyone, that they are being malicious. If someone just fucks up, and it was an honest mistake, whatever, like that's not worth making a video about. But if it's misinformation, and they're using it clearly for their own financial gain, or some other type of gain, maybe they, they have some fucked up worldview, yeah, that's when I'll call it out. And I don't really get any pushback, because um, usually they know they're wrong. And they know that if they confronted me about it, it would just make them look bad. So often they'll just ignore it. They'll just take the hit or maybe they'll like change a title or something. And it's nice having a platform where I can actually get shit done where I can actually see, oh, I made this video and something actually changed, like something actually happened. That That's nice to actually see. 
But at the same time, it's still a huge uphill battle. The only two times that things have ever really happened were one, the G Shred thing where he copyright struck my video. That didn't end well for him, did it? Uh, and number two, Doug Brignoli, where I had I thought it was a pretty fair review, some good, some bad, and yet he made like five or six videos really cherry picking stuff and, and not being honest at all. Um, and his following super cultish. Not big, but they are, I mean, I guess hats off to him. He's really, like, controlled them super well. You know, it is what it is. I think it's part of the job. If you call out bullshit, you know, some people are just going to get uh, upset. Too bad. That is all for this Q&A. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel, you can grab a copy of my book. I will link it in a pinned comment down below. Thank you so much for the support, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.